Um, the brain does oscillate, um, and the frequency has been speculated that there are correlation with the animal behaviors. But more than that, its uh, oscillation are sometimes coupled. Uh, we know that using the exciter inhibitor networks, we can easily find oscillation in the oral network. But how does coupling, especially phase coupling, uh, can emerge from the physiology and anatomy that we see in the brain? Uh, today, Alexandra is going to talk about the modeling of phase amplitude coupling. Um, Alexandra Hatsi Kamliminu, I hope that I spell your name so, uh, right. I'm sorry if it's not is a PhD student from University of Toronto working with Dr. Skinner and she is talking about uh, on the generation of the theta rate rhythms and theta gamma phase amplitude coupling. Thank you Alexandra for joining today and we are looking forward to hearing your talk. Hey, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very yes. much Jose, and thank you um, to Ventaria and very much. Um, uh, uh, grouping for to give me an opportunity to present my work today with an oral presentation. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the generation of theta rhythms and the theta gamma phase amplitude coupling uh, work that was done uh, during my PhD. So theta rhythms are very prominent oscillatory activities in many brain structures, but they are particularly uh, strong in the hippocampus. This is an area that is associated with special navigation, rapid eye movement, sleep, and many cognitive functions. Um, and as a result, theta rhythms have been um, considered to constitute a very promising biomarker for learning and memory with applications in pathologies such as Alzheimer's and epilepsy. The C1 hippocampus particularly has a large variety of inhibitory cells. However, a cell type centric explanation of these rhythms is still missing. So my goal has been in general to decipher the cellular origin of theta and gamma oscillations and to unravel the biophysical principles of their cross-frequency coupling. The biophysical context, the physiological context that I use for my modeling work is that of an intact in vitro hippocampus preparation that autonomously generates theta rhythms without external inputs from the C3 or the interrhinal cortex. Um, this same area also produces gamma rhythms, which are coupled to theta. This preparation presents a number of benefits. Theta rhythms in vivo are very state dependent as they depend on the particular behavioral state of the animal and they are very regular. They depend on the uh, specific pathways that are activated at any given time. For those reasons, it's very hard to decipher the cell type contributions to those rhythms and also to understand the fundamental mechanism of theta rhythms. Now, it's also very important to point out that theta rhythms are local field potential activities, and it is very important in computational studies to model them utilizing biophysically realistic LFP models. So LFPs are the summation of transmembrane currents that pass through the cellular membranes at the vicinity of a recording electrode tip. Uh, in my work, I've utilized uh, mainly two models. One is a simplified model, I call it the minimal model. It, it is uh, comprised of simplified cells that they don't have any morphological aspect or biophysical representations for the ion channels and intrinsic properties. Instead, they are Zikovic neurons. They are described by a set of differential equations that reproduces the dynamic output of the cellular activity. I've also utilized the second model. I call it here the detailed C1 model, which is the state-of-the-art biophysically accurate model of the C1 hippocampus that produces this intrahippocampal oscillatory activities. It is comprised of cells with morphological detail, realistic representations of their ion channels and intrinsic properties, and experimentally derived connectivity. Now, this takes me to the first part of my results in which I'm going to talk about how linking these two models allows us to understand where the frequency of the theta rhythm is uh, generated. The challenge with this biophysically accurate models is that due to their multi-parametric and high dimensional nature, it is very difficult to analyze them using theoretical tools. So in my work, we propose an approach in which we use hypothesis from the simplified models in application to the biophysically detailed models. And we examine whether those predictions are true. First, we compared the two models to identify commonalities and differences in their structure that could underlie similar or different theta mechanisms. These were two separate models developed by different groups, which, however, represent the same intrahippocampal activities. 
Uh, then we isolated a piece from the detailed model. We call it the segment model, which is the same in cell numbers as the minimal for meaningful comparisons. We found that the two models varied with respect to the feedforward excitatory conductances to the pyramidal cell. These are the recurrent pyramidal pyramidal conductances and the adrenal cortex and C3 to pyramidal conductances. For those reasons, we focused our investigation around, around these particular conductances at first. We found that the theta rhythm in the segment model increases with both ECCA for the pyramidal and the pyramidal pyramidal conductances. Uh, the theta frequency is almost anticorrelated. And the stimulation that represents the activation of those conductances increases as the ECC through the pyramidal conductance decreases. And we can understand how these networks depend on those conductances if we take a look at the inner workings of the cellular activities. Let's take a look at two example cases, a case A and a case B. Case A is characterized by a low ECC through the pyramidal conductance. For that reason, the stimulation representing the activation of those afferents is high which means that there is a strong concurrent activation of most of the inhibitory cells in the network. Now, in case B, the ECC through the pyramidal conductance is large. For that reason, less stimulation is required to induce the same amount of, of activation of the pyramidal cells, and the activity of the rest of the inhibitory cells is low. This showed us in a very illustrative manner that what seems to be important for the theta rhythms is the input, the net input to the pyramidal cells, regardless of the exact composition of that input, whether it's, constitute, it's comprised of strong inhibitory and excitatory currents or weaker only excitatory currents, as, is came, as in the case B. In fact, those two networks produce theta rhythms of very similar power. So that allowed us to hypothesize that uh, what, what is really important is this uh, net amount of current that is delivered to the pyramidal cells, and we investigated this hypothesis. So we plotted the theta frequency of any given network as a function of the mean input current to the pyramidal cells, and we found that these two modalities are very strongly correlated. This tells us that the theta rhythm is controlled by that input current, and that input current can predict the frequency of the resulting theta network. We also found that this input current was very noisy, as uh, the network that we analyzed was only a segment of the original full C1 model and many of the inhibitory populations hadn't yet uh, gotten the chance to organize into coherently firing populations, which showed us that the rhythm is not imposed by the inhibitory cells, but it is initiated, generated by the very pyramidal cells, so long as the amount of the current is appropriate. It would further suggest that uh, the frequency depends on the intrinsic properties of the pyramidal cells. Now, experimentally, we know that if we remove the PV positive cells, we we'll lose the theta rhythms. We did the same test in our models, and we found that in the case A network, removing the PV cells abolished theta rhythms, but not in the network of case B, which um, tells us that the contribution of the inhibitory cells is important and more biophysically realistic. As a matter of fact, we found that removing the PV cells increased the standard deviation of the mean input current, which tells us that the mean input current became a lot more irregular and that dysregulated the theta rhythm. Um, now that takes me to the second part of my results. Can we utilize the um, understanding that we obtained from the analysis of the segment model in application to the full C1 model that is comprised of the eight inhibitory cell types and it's a much larger, larger network? So we need to notice um, two particular trends in this network. We have two types of inhibitory classes. First are the OLM and the bistratified cells, which are primarily driven by the pyramidal cells. And for that reason, they fire in a theta-based manner. And we have the rest of the inhibitory cell classes, which fire in a very noisy fashion because they are primarily driven by noisy external afferents. With that, let's take a look at the last 500 milliseconds of this raster plot. We will first accept the duration of an any given theta cycle is controlled by the pyramidal cells and the net input that they receive and by extension um, to their intrinsic properties. So let's take a look at a given theta cycle from 3.8 to 3.9 milliseconds. By virtue of the pyramidal pyramidal connections, more and more pyramidal cells are recruited to the uh, theta cycle and the numbers maximize at the peak of it. At that point, the pyramidal cells activate the OLM and the bistratified cells. The bistratified cells form very strong connections with the CCK basket cells and they inhibit them. The CCK basket cells form very strong connections with the PV positive basket cells and they disinhibit them, 
mainly activate them. The activation of the PV basket cells induces the termination of the theta burst. So uh, even though the very frequency is controlled by the pyramidal cells, the termination of the pyramidal cell theta burst is controlled by sequential activation of inhibitory classes. So that takes me now to the end of my presentation. In the first one, uh, the first part using the segment model, we showed that the theta rhythms are initiated by the pyramidal cells and the data frequency is controlled by the net input, the mean input they receive. And in the second part, I uh, showed how the termination of the pyramidal cell theta burst is controlled by sequential activation of inhibitory classes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a brilliant. Oh, sorry, if you want to acknowledge people. Oh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge my supervisor, Professor Francis Skinner, and uh, my committee meeting members and all my colleagues and collaborators. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a brilliant talk. And uh, uh, I, 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 I think that there are a bunch of questions are coming up there right now. Two questions. Uh, RDT asked that, uh, how you, have you seen any theta frequency change when he inputs from only EC, uh, cortex, or CA3? are considered? Yes, there is a change in the frequency, but um, one should consider uh, also the, um, we will try to associate that with the mean input current that is delivered at any given time. Uh, but definitely when, um, when uh, the inputs only from the CA3 are considered, um, we, we tend to see a bit of a higher frequency and CA3 is also associated with gamma rhythms. Uh, but um, I haven't done a proper analysis of that to, 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 to answer very uh, strictly. Um, but the idea is that probably there will be changes in the frequency even along the septotemporal axis where different kind of inputs are more prevalent than others. Uh, that's great. So um, I think the second question is also relevant to this one. Um, uh, a broader view testing the idea that could be assumed CA1 network is more suitable for pattern compilations in comparison with the pattern separation. Mm -hmm. Is there any circuit-based explanation in results supporting this idea? And the second question that Amin asks is that, could we assume that there is a competitive process at the circuit level between CA1 and CA3, or is there any evidence in your result? I'm gonna stop sharing. I think I can see the questions as well, right? Yeah, so the first question was about pattern completion and pattern separation. Um, so I, I don't think we can yet speak to those mechanisms in, ter in terms of uh, pattern completion and pattern separation for two reasons. The first one is that uh, this circuitry explains the intrahippocampal theta rhythm, so not the theta rhythm that we see in vivo and uh, these mechanisms are in vivo mechanisms, the pattern completion, the pattern separation mechanisms. So my, uh, the, the mechanism that I'm suggesting right now speaks to the, uh, the variability of the C1 to intrinsically generate these activities and then how external input modulate these rhythms, it's still something that needs to be deciphered. So I would say that we, we, we can't uh, deduce a lot just from this mechanism on this question. Uh, but, but I think definitely the mechanism that I'm suggesting speaks very much to the role of the different cell types, which then can be translated in vivo. So I think it's a very important uh, first step. And then the second question is, could we assume that there is a competitive process at circuit between C1 and C3? Competitive uh, process. Um, again, to, to think about uh, this sort of relationship, I, I would have to think about them in the context of some behavioral state. So um, I'm not I'm not sure uh, whether I, I mean, can answer uh, that question generally. Um, I would have to think of some particular behavioral state to sort of uh, think about competitive relationship between the two uh, bit regions. Um, I mean, the very idea of the, the main idea of my work has been that the C1 can generate these rhythms on its own. Definitely they are a lot weaker than they are uh, in vivo. And the C3 inputs that I have considered are very noisy. So they are not spike trains, they're not structured inputs. Um, so I haven't, I haven't explicitly looked at the spike train inputs from the C3 um, in this work. 
Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was great. And uh, by that, we are on 45 minutes and we have to wrap up these sessions. Uh, we had an amazing talk today and uh, I really enjoyed their talk. Again, thank you all of you for participating today. And uh, I'm pretty sure the attendees also enjoyed the talk. See you again, probably in the rest of the conference. Thank you. Hope you have the rest, thank you so uh, much. Good rest of the day. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye.